committee will come to order. Transportation Finance Policy, State of Minnesota. And the committee legislative assistant will note the role as we come and go today. Members, thank you for your attendance and your attention uh, to the approval of minutes. Before we do that, I'm going to turn off my phone because it's not like I'm going to take a call while I'm working with you folks. I encourage you to silence yours if you can. <coughs> there we go. Minutes. The approval of the minutes. Representative Vogel. The motion is before us, members, to approve the minutes of the uh, March 14th meeting. Boy, we were busy that day, members. I've never seen 10 pages of minutes before. Discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. All in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The minutes are approved. First bill on the agenda today is Representative McDonald, House File 1586, Motorcycle Safety Education Program. <coughs> Representative McDonald, welcome to the committee. If you'd um, give it just a moment, we'll find somebody to move your bill to get it before us. And members, uh, the bill um, would, the next stop would be the uh, Committee on Public Safety. A motion, Representative Schmansky. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move House File 1586, recommended to pass and be sent to public safety. Thank you, Representative Schmansky. Uh, Representative McDonald, your bill is before us. If you'd like to explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Uh, this bill, what it does in a nutshell, is it allows the Commissioner of Public Safety to distribute 50% of the funds that are paid for by motorcycle enthusiasts when they pay an endorsement fee to all schools that will train for public safety for motorcyclists throughout the state of Minnesota. Currently, Minsku offers this service. I, think, believe, I believe they have over 31 programs. They do it very well. They have a curriculum that's strict and is very productive and works, as do six private sector schools who use the same curriculum and do it very well themselves. In 1982, a law was uh, passed here in this office or in this, uh, at the Capitol, I think my father was probably on board at the time, which established a pool of money to help educate and train motorcyclists, keep them safe on the road. It was a great idea. And the money was to be funded by the motorcyclist through a registration fee, an endorsement fee, they call it. In 2003, the Department of Public Safety approached Minsky and said, we would like to expand this program. There's only one private sector uh, school. Let's expand it throughout the whole states, rural areas and metro. Seemed like a good idea. The money's, uh, they said, great. Uh, it's, the money is, comes from the registration fee, again, the endorsement fee. Uh, shortly after 2003, any funds that went to to the private sector stopped and it all went to Minsku. Therefore, the big government, Minsku, got 50% of the funds and the private sector got zero, making it hard for the private sector, mom and pops, to compete with the public sector. So this bill, what it says is the Department of Commissioner shall reimburse all schools up to 50% of their program, of the uh, enrollment fee. Not just the Minsku schools, not just the public schools, but all schools, private sector and public sector, in harmony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Um, Representative McDonald, I noticed we have a um, fiscal note that indicates about 21000 a year ongoing. Uh, Ms. Johnson, can you explain to me what that would be? Is that for rulemaking, or is that uh, the cost of figuring out who else to give the money to? Just speak to it, if you would. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, <coughs> excuse me. I believe that that was an original fiscal note and not on the, the engrossment that was um, since done. Is that correct? And we've got, since got a preliminary one from DPS um, indicating zero impact. A zero impact on the new one. Thank you. That correct. warms the chairman's heart a little bit. Representative McDonald, do you care to illuminate any further about the fiscal note situation? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I concur with the, your staff. Thank you. Members, questions for Representative McDonald before we go to a couple of testifiers who have asked to speak to the bill? See, uh, Representative Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald, I, I understand that this particular piece of legislation would no longer make it permissible for um, or, or discretionary for the department to convey these funds, but it, it would become mandatory. And, and can you explain why you believe that is a, a role that we should play when it comes to um, a state agency deciding based on looking at a program, its criteria, as to whether they should be reimbursed up to 50% of, of uh, their expenditures. Representative McDonald. Mr. Chairman, 
Rep Representative Champion, thank you for that question. My thoughts on that, and I'm not alone on this, is that because of the bill's original intent back in 1982 was to educate and uh, train all, uh, uh, educate and train all motorcyclists through all schools, that it is important that the Department of Public Safety shall uh, uh, shall uh, fund up to 50 percent to all schools. Follow up, Representative Champion. So can you tell me what happened in the marketplace? Did someone in particular, like private schools, come to you and say, um, we are not happy about the fact that we don't get any um, aspect of those grant funds? Uh, what happened that, that is driving your motivation to put forward this proposed legislation? Representative McDonald, can you speak to the genesis of the bill? Yes, very good. Thank you, Representative Champion. This was brought to my attention by a constituent who lives in my hometown of Delano who offers one of the schools at another participating business in Delano. So naturally, as a, a state representative who represents Wright County and the city of Delano, I was uh, thrilled to be able to help a uh, constituent. And because of the merits of the bill, I think it's very important that if this fund was originally set up by this body many years ago, to train and educate all public safety motorcyclists to keep us safe on the road uh, and funded by the motorcyclists themselves, then that should be the intent of the bill. I believe that in over the years that it's changed and now it's uh, just Minsku having an opportunity to train and with these funds, I think it was an unfair advantage to the private sector and not the original intent of this body. One last question. Follow up. You? Yes. Uh, Representative McDonald, so it sounds to me that there is this assumption that the term schools that is used in your, your bill on uh, line 1.13 um, would, would, would include but not be limited to K-12 through uh, public schools. It would also uh, seem to include non-public schools, but it would also seem to um, include for-profit schools and could also include like other driving services, community colleges, et cetera. And so it appears that if that is the case, that the cost of administration may increase. So can you speak to that, even though I know you said that there is a, um, there's zero fiscal impact. Have we taken some analysis to understand if the term school is being expanded and, and, and could include others, how that would have some additional um, expense to it? Uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Champion, uh, yes, this, but your question is all schools, no, it's just, it would not pertain to K through 12, just Minsku who are offering this program. I understand there might be a little discrepancy in the bill in which it's written. Uh, I don't want it to be interpreted that it's all schools, K through 12, and uh, so perhaps that's uh, something that I need to look at uh, as an amendment, but it's just Minsku and other schools. Thank you. Uh, members, we have... Uh uh, or is there more? I'm sorry, were you going to? Because we have a couple of testifiers I'd like to bring up in the uh, uh, chat for about the bill for a moment. Uh, Frank Ernst from Abate. Uh, Mr. Ernst, are you here? Testify to the bill. And then I also have uh, Bill Schaefer from uh, Department of Public Safety. Schaefer, I'm calling on you next. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ernst, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the recorded. Uh, record and then proceed with your testimony. We'd appreciate that. Thank you. My name is Frank Ernst. I'm the State Coordinator Trustee for American Bikers for Awareness Training and Education, commonly referred to as ABATE of Minnesota. I'm here today because of some feedback that ABATE of Minnesota has heard. We've been told by many people that it's been said that we support this change. And I want to clear up the record on that. ABATE of Minnesota is not in support of this change. Um, many of our members and our chapters participate in the rider training program. Uh, we've had a great deal of success with the program, the way it's currently administered. Um, we did, were involved in the program years ago when it was all offered by private party. And quite honestly, uh, the program works really, really well right now. And we would encourage keeping it like it is. Uh, thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Ernst. Questions for Mr. Ernst before we move on to the next testifier, uh, Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the testifier. Uh, do you have any reason to believe, though, if, if the Harley-Davidson uh, dealer in Delano adopted the same training program uh, to allow for a training program under this new bill uh, to happen and get reimbursement, that the quality would be any worse? Mr. Ernst? I, I can't. I can't speak to that. I do not know that it would get worse. 
uh, like I say, I just know that we do have very, very good success, success with the program working the way it is. Follow-up, uh, follow yeah. Representative Benson. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I hear that you're you're not in favor of it, but are you against it? I mean, I, it, I have something that says that you're neutral on it. But let's say we did extend it. We saw the quality not go down at all. Would it really have that much make that much a difference to the abate program in Minnesota? Uh, Mr. Ernst. Mr. Chairman, um, I, we, we have not voted in position of against it. Um, probably the biggest thing we're against is the, um, we're not sure how it was originally stated that we were in support of it, if that was intentionally to be misleading or if it just happened. But, but we certainly do not support it. Uh, Representative McDonald. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I've been working on this for two years and nowhere on paper or through sound, sight, or uh, any testifier, does, did I know or think that abate supported this? I was well aware they were neutral in this, so I understand uh, the testifier's uh, concerns, but I've been working on this two years, and I knew that abate was neutral in this, and nor did I never mention that they were supportive of this. Now, if I may continue, I'm surprised a little bit because I know abate, and I have many uh, in my district. They're great folks, hard workers. They have mom-and-pop businesses like myself. And they're for freedom. They don't want government interfering in their daily lives as much as possible. They like uh, businesses to thrive, the private sector, not governments overtaking. So I'm surprised that they're not for more freedom, especially in the public sector. But I'm willing to work. This is going to go to uh, public safety, and I'm going to be happy to sit down and talk with, uh, actually I had a conversation with Mark Berger just a few moments ago, and he shared his concerns with me, and I'm very excited to uh, meet with him to uh, address some of their concerns. Before I go to uh, Representative Morrow, Mr. Ernst, the, uh, the committee is interested to know then um, if uh, a Bates official position is not in favor of the bill, is it actually opposed to the bill in its current form? Is that what you're saying? We have, we have not taken an official position. So you are officially of neutral. Opposition. You're officially neutral. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure we understood that. Uh, Representative Morrow. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take a little offense to what you just said. As an Abate member myself, I don't think that Mr. Ernst is saying anything about freedom pro or con, and I think you're putting words in his mouth. He didn't say he was against private industry. What he said was it started with private schools, and he felt it worked better when it moved to the public schools. And as one who did take this training at South Central College, I'll tell you, Mr. Ernst, it worked well. Now, Mr. now Representative McDonald, I don't know how I'm going to vote yet on your bill, but I think it's offensive for you to say that he is somehow against freedom because he is simply stating his view that it worked better in one situation than another, and he told you he's neutral. Or at least the organization is neutral. He just came to correct the record that somebody had said they were in favor. Mr. Chair, uh, I have a, do have a question for Representative McDonald. Representative McDonald, uh, looking at line 1.15 of your bill, it says, shall re reimburse all schools. So if I hear Mr. Ernst, one of the concerns is about the quality of the education. <laughs> Will DPS be required to approve a school, or if a school is offering motorcycle safety education, is it there, thereby entitled to reimbursement? In other words, I don't see where there's going to be approval for the schools, or see what, you, what you've got here is all schools and other approved organizations. So other approved organizations, but doesn't say the schools have to be approved. Could you explain that disparity to me? Mr. McDonald, Representative McDonald, can you speak to that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Morrow, I have a testifier that I've been working with, uh, that um, gentleman by the name of Mr. Duncan. I'd like to call him down to uh, help uh, answer your question. Before we go there, um, I think there are a couple more questions for this testifier. Do you have a follow-up to this testifier, no, Representative? Uh, Representative Leidiger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be brief. Uh, Mr. Ernst, uh, I wanted to get something cleared up. The Is it a requirement to go through this training course to get a to get a uh, uh, what's it called endorsement. Uh, endorsement on your driver's license to ride a motorcycle mr. Ernst adults are not required to take the training under 18 I believe is the requirement that they would need to take this training follow-up representative yes so so if you're 18 or over it is optional it would uh, is is my understanding so correct me if I'm wrong on that, but let me let me move on but uh, a person does have to take an examination all, all people have to take an examination to get that endorsement. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Ernst. Mr. Chairman that is correct Everybody has to take an examination 
Representative Liger. Okay, and uh, one last question: uh, who who would de who determines where the funds go? And maybe this is for uh, Representative uh, McDonald. Uh, does is it the Department of Public Safety that that makes that determination? Where the uh, so the application goes directly to them, and they make and and they fund the they write the check out. Uh, Mr. Ernst or Representative McDonald, I think I see in the current law that it's actually the Commissioner of Education that disperses the funds. But can you speak to that any differently? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yeah, uh, this was at uh, higher ed uh, finance uh, just a week and a half ago in which we struck the language of the Department of Education. The Department of Education was completely on board because they mm. really had nothing to do with this uh, program. They were kind of a middleman, so it no longer is the Department of Education, just the uh, Department, the Commissioner of Public Safety. Well, to be correct, Representative McDonald, if this bill becomes law, it will become public safety, but in current law, it is the Department of Education that disperses those funds, correct? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yes, that is correct. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Representative Gauthier, I think, is next on the list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question is not for the testifier, so I can wait. Thank you. We'll keep you on the list then. Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I just want to be clear on one thing. I, I know what uh, Representative Morrow was, was saying. Um, I'm not sure that I heard the testifier say that exact thing. I think he said that it is working fine the way it is, and let's leave it. He did say that. He didn't say it's working better than it was. I just want to make make that clear. I think it is working fine. That's one thing. But private sector uh, classes or, or teachers or courses that are going on are still working as well out there, too. Thank you for your observation. Um, I have two other testifiers on the list. But, Representative, did I hear you say you had someone else that you wanted to speak to the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do if he could answer the questions of the members, if they have one that I'm not able to answer. Give me a name, please. Mr. Jed Duncan. Let's uh, hold on to Mr. Duncan's testimony, unless there are specific questions that he can answer. But I do have, uh, what? I do. Representative Champion, I'm sorry, I didn't see you on the list. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the testifier. So I guess I've, I, I did hear a little about whether the, it's working fine now, but I also think I heard you say that you have, have the institutional capacity as to the way it was running before when uh, it, it was largely run by or the program was administered by by those in the private sector so can you tell me if you feel it's it's working better or worse than it was before from your vantage point mr. Ernst can you speak to that mr. chairman I can share my personal opinion on that I have taken the class registered for the class been involved in the classes for quite a number of years as a pri when it was privately done as well as when it's being done now through Minsku and the way the system works today in my opinion is far superior to the way it was years ago um, this spring I have had opportunity to, to to register a group of my friends the writing friends through a beta Minnesota that will be taking the class as well as another one of my friends that will be taking a beginners class uh, to gain his endorsement um, all that registration was taken care of from the comfort of my easy chair at home and I got confirmation that it was all done uh, the payment of it was done online and it and it just has worked out very very well uh, the instructors that I've worked been trained by the coach rider coaches I've been trained by have done an excellent job and I think in my opinion probably with with less arrogance if you would than some of the instructors that I was taught by while it was privately done thank you for your comments uh, mr. Uh, Schaefer uh, Bill Schaefer could you come and give us your comments please Mr. Schaefer, if you'd identify yourself for the recorded record and proceed with your testimony, we'd appreciate that. Mr. Chair, Representatives, my name is Bill Schaefer. I manage the Minnesota Motorcycle Safety Program for the Department of Public Safety. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representatives, the Department of Public Safety has a Motorcycle Safety Advisory Task Force comprised of motorcyclists 
from a wide spectrum of the white riding community. They advise public safety on the operation of the Minnesota Motorcycle Safety Program. They have made a formal recommendation that DPS oppose this bill, and so we are. The motion to oppose passed unanimously with this committee, with this task force. Their concern is that this bill will increase tuition costs as DPS will have to reduce the amount of our support with our training project with Minskew if we begin to subsidize other private providers. Thank you for your comments. Uh, questions to this testifier? Uh, Representative uh, Leidiger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You said that the, the price of the would, would go up. Why would that happen? Uh, Mr. Uh, Schaefer. Mr. Chair, Representatives, we currently program every dime we take in for a motorcycle safety program and we would need to reduce the amount that we currently program with Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Lattie. Is that, is it, you, you get paid uh, based on, uh, is it a prorate per student? You're getting a flat rate? Or how does that work? Mr. Schaefer, could you explain that to us? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representatives, we pay Minskew uh, some fees to train and coordinate our instructors. We also pay them a per course rate. Uh, for the basic rider course, which is the most popular course in the state and probably 90% of training, we pay Minskew $320 per basic rider course completed. Uh, enrollment in a basic rider course is 12 students maximum. We probably average around 11 students per course in the basic rider course in our current agreement. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Leidiger. Representative Morrow. Thank well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Uh, Representative Leidiger, I think this is probably the crux of the matter, as Mr. Schaefer's describing it. If we pass the bill, and I'm not objecting to the bill, but if we pass the bill, what I'm hearing is the money would be spread to more schools because there would be more schools eligible than appear to be, at least maybe not eligible, but are receiving money. There are private providers right now who are not receiving money who I think Representative McDonald is trying to make sure they do receive money. That's why it says shall as opposed to may. But when you're taking the same pot of money, and you're sending it to more schools, you're sending less to an individual school. So I, what I've heard from Minsky in the past as well is because they'd be getting less, they'd either have to cut or charge more because they can't do the same amount with the same money. Mr. Shaver, do I understand that basic concept correctly? Mr. That, Shaver? That is correct, Representative. Uh, Follow-up, President Morrow? No, thank you. To that point, um, I'm looking in this fiscal note that's no longer relevant, but it does have members on page five some very useful data that I think uh, would help shed some light on things. One thing that uh, the committee might be interested in is that there is apparently a, a maintenance contract, Mr. Schaefer, and that apparently this fund also, it's about a $900,000 a year uh, fund, and it also is used to buy uh, training motorcycles. Are those... Um, uh, who takes ownership of those? Uh, are they spread around to the different sites? Can you just give us a brief description of how that uh, how that works with the equipment being spread around, acquired, who owns it, so on and so forth? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Chairman representatives. Uh, public Safety has contracted to provide this training since 1986. From 86 through 90, we contracted with the Minnesota Institute of Public Health. Mm -hmm. From 1990 through 2002, we contracted with Comprehensive Safety Systems, a private provider, to provide this training. Since all three, we've been working with Minskew. During that duration, public safety has always provided the equipment for the training provider. And so the Department of Public Safety, for several years now, has owned a fleet of training motorcycles and a fleet of transportation trailers. Currently, there's 350 training motorcycles in that fleet and 25 transport trailers to uh, cover training around the state at the 31 Minsky campuses that hold host training. Can you tell us who actually is responsible for moving that equipment from location to location? Mr. Yeah, the Chairman. Department of Public Safety has a contract with a hauler to move that equipment, and the Department of Public Safety maintains a contract with a mechanic uh, to maintain the motorcycles, provide repairs during the season, replace motorcycles that get broken at training sites, uh, and in the metro area, that uh, mechanic also makes a weekly service run and fuels uh, all the sites as well. Thank you. Representative Shemansky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Jones, my question uh, deals with uh, on the bill, or actually in the statute or existing, it says the uh, safety education courses uh, can be reimbursed for up to 50% of the cost. Is that typically, do we go to the 50% no matter what the cost is, or is there a cap in that formula somewhere? Mr. Shaper? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representatives, uh, the statute caps uh, our, our ex expenses uh, at 65% of, of our receipts each year. Uh, the statute speaks to paying for the training and coordination of instructors and also reimbursing schools up, up to the cost. Our, our agreement with Minsky right now is reimbursing uh, part of their costs and also uh, paying for the coordination and training of the instructors. And that agreement is not at the 65% level. That agreement is approximately, right now, uh, this current fiscal year is $385,700 uh, is our current contract. Follow up? Uh, Representative uh, Gauthier, do you want to hold on just a moment yet? Or, uh, oh, I can go. Okay, Representative Gauthier. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Representative McDonald. I'm trying to understand here. Um, you want to open the pot of money to private businesses that are already offering a service and I would assume are making a profit or they wouldn't be in business. And we're being critical of a, a public program that's working well, according to testimony. I, and I, I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure you, why you want to do that. Can you explain that to me again? Uh, Representative McDonald. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gautier, thank you. Um, I was very critical in my opening statement when I said that Minsky was offering a program and they do it very well, as does the private sector. Uh, as I said originally, um, the intent of the bill was to train, to have all schools have the ability to train this program for the two-wheeled uh, program. Uh, so I think it is only fair that, the, that all schools, with the intent of the bill from 1982, have an opportunity to have some of the endorsing fee, which is paid for by the motorcyclist. Okay, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Representative McDonald. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Gauthier. You know, I think I would agree with you if, uh, if we didn't have finite resources. Um, but clearly we do have finite resources and why we would undermine a public program that's being successful and, uh, and doing a good job in moving around the state uh, to undermine that to, to subsidize private enterprise, which is already making money doing the same thing, is, is just beyond me. Um, um, you know, I, I hear a lot about subsidies, and I guess it depends on who you're subsidizing, but this is one that I don't think I can support. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Representative Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the center fire. Uh, are any of the uh, public safety motorcycles trucked to the private sites to, to help with their training at all? Uh, Mr. Schaefer, can you speak to that? Uh, Mr. Chair, representatives, no, they are not. Okay. So they don't get, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So they don't get the um, motorcycles and they don't get any money. Uh, and to the, uh, Representative Gautier's point is that it seems like the state is picking winners and losers in the marketplace rather than allowing for the money that is com that comes in uh, to be available to anybody who provides the training. So that, that's a comment, and I no more questions. Uh, there is a um, representative Morrow. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to follow up, so I'm clarifying. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, Representative Benson, I would be with you, especially if we were subsidizing a, a different one private entity and sending all public motorcycles to one private business and not another. In this case, we're sending them to a Minsky campus. I understand you might not see a difference in that. Although, Mr. Chair, I'm going to have a question at the end. Is, is this bill going to go to higher ed? Because it hasn't been to higher ed. It's been to education finance. Mm -hmm. So that will be a question for you. Uh, but, Mr. Schaefer, I'm going to go back to page 5 where uh, we were earlier. And I'm reading there are five uh, numbered points here on this fiscal note. I don't know, sir, if you have a copy. I, I do not. Uh... Here, Bill. Thank you, Representative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, I'm on, uh, Mr. Schaefer, I'm on page 5. Yes, sir. And I'm looking at the five indented points about where the money is going now. And then I look below and the paragraph that says the statute allows for 65 percent. On average, we are spending approximately 45 percent of the funding available to us each year. 
if this bill were to become law, would it stay 45%, do you predict, on training and coordinating instructors? Uh, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, representatives, I, I believe so because there are so many other outlays in this program, including equipment, maintaining equipment, and uh, public safety also conducts an educational campaign to support motorcycle safety throughout the year. Follow up, Representative Morrill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Schaefer, I want to follow up on Representative Benson's question then. If other schools are, if you have to make contracts with other schools upon passage of this bill, would you need to send equipment to those other schools as well? Mr. Schaefer? I, I do not know that I would assume possibly, but I don't know if we would or not. But I assume if it's a level playing field that indeed we would and we would need to purchase a significant amount more of equipment. Uh, follow up. Just one more. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just ask about, there are four other items here that are listed. I looked at the equipment. How about mechanical services? Would you need to provide mechanical services to each provider? Mr. Schaefer, perhaps in answering that question, you can, if you can, educate the committee on when our equipment and maintenance became part of the rubric uh, here instead of just uh, having training programs that people would presumably bring their own equipment to. Yeah, were you aware of when that changed and how that worked, Mr. Schaefer? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, I don't have real early history on this, but I know when we contracted with Comprehensive Safety Systems, uh, starting in 1990 through 2002. Uh, part of that contract required that they provided the maintenance for Department of Public Safety's fleet of motorcycles. Uh, we did run into some diff service difficulties with that contract, which is why we changed mm -hmm. and sought out Minsku as a provider. And at that time, the Department of Public Safety thought we would be better off the contract directly for mechanical services because one of the problems we had had was uh, our contractor at that time, Comprehensive Safety, was unable to keep a mechanic on staff the last couple of years they had the contract. And so uh, our equipment suffered. Uh, we had more breakdowns, less operable motorcycles for the courses. Follow up? Are we good? Uh, there's also uh, Joan Rasmussen from South Central College. Uh, Ms. Rasmussen, are you here? Would you like to speak about the bill? Please, thank Mr. you. Mr. Chair, may I uh, Mr. One? Schaefer, you have a closing comment, and then don't go far. We may have more questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, just one clarification on some testimony I heard earlier. Uh, since this statute is passed, uh, Department of Public Safety has administered this fund. Mm -hmm. The statute provided the opportunity to uh, send money to the Department of Education to reimburse schools. Uh, public Safety and Education, when this statute passed, determined that Public Safety would just administer this program. Mm -hmm. I don't have details on the history, but Public safety has always administered this program and, and hasn't dispersed any of the funding to education uh, since it's been around. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Ms. Rasmussen. If, uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony, we'd appreciate it. Hello, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Joanne Rasmussen. I'm with South Central College in North Mankato and I'm also the Rider Training Project Manager for the State of Minnesota. We were contacted in 2003 by the Department of Public Safety to provide a statewide motorcycle program at a reasonable cost. Today we do training at 31 locations across the state. The fee for the basic rider course is $160 and that fee has not increased within the last six years. Uh, this is not an open enrollment course. I mean, this is an open enrollment course. It is not a credit course. Credit courses do get reimbursed. We do not. And because of the cost effectiveness of our program, we are capable to do that training statewide, which also means we were able to contract with the Minnesota Army National Guard. And uh, the reason they contracted with us is because the soldiers then do not have to travel uh, to different locations, probably going as far as six hours to get the training, and then they end up making excuses like the cat's best friend died, you know. So anyway, um, so they were very happy to do the contract with us. Uh, they, none of them have to drive more than within one hour distance. Um, if this bill passes, I'm deeply concerned about the cause and effect it will have on the statewide motorcycle program. I'm also concerned about the students who live in East Grand Forks, who live in Eveleth, who live in International Falls, and how are they going to get the training that they need? Uh, we have had a very um, 
great contract with the Department of Public Safety. And before 2003, they approached us because the private party was not able to meet the capacity at which the program needed to be. So we have the capacity to train uh, 12,000 individuals. And again, we do have the 31 sites. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. And I, again, I, I beg you to consider the cost to the consumers and also the motorcycle enthusiasts of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rasmussen, for your testimony. Members, are questions for Ms. Rasmussen at all? Representative Hausman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's that last point I think we should underscore. We haven't been talking so much about that. I mean, that's ultimately the issue. It has kept the cost low for uh, the average person seeking this training. Um, and that, I, I think, is, um, you know, as we look at this, one of, the, one of the considerations I would think that we should have. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Representative Gauthier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in reference to Representative Benson, I don't think it's about picking winners and losers. I think it's about public policy. And, and the state of Minnesota has made a determination to keep lows down, and public safety is an issue with this training. Now, if, if uh, a business is in this uh, providing services and they're not making money, I think the market would say they should go out of business. Um, and, and so you can't really have it both ways. Um, and uh, so, so this is really about public policy because we do have private vendors who are making a living uh, providing this service. So why we would subsidize that and increase their profit is beyond me. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify about this bill, for or against or about? I've got uh, just a few people on the list here. We've accomplished those. Sir, you would like to speak about it, if you would? Uh, Ms. Rasmussen, thank you for your testimony. Um, thank you. If you'd like to, to stay in the audience for a few minutes, we're going to have a little more chat about this bill and then move it along. Sir, please come down here and identify yourself for the uh, record to the committee. Hmm. Your name and uh, who you represent, if you have. Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Jed Duncan. Mm -hmm. I live in St. Paul. Not that that means anything, but uh, <laughs> well, it helps to identify you for the record. Organization coming from out of state here. So, to address a couple issues we heard already, mm -hmm. and I respect all these concerns, especially that related to quality. Currently, the schools that deliver motorcycle training, and I believe it was you, represent, Representative Champion's uh, concern. Uh, I'll try to address the chair, Mr. Sorry. Duncan, if you would, please. I'm sorry, Chairman. Uh, that's better right. Thing. I know that's new to you, but that's kind of the way we do this. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. Mr. Chairman, committee. Hmm. Approved schools are defined as something that isn't K through 12 or college or private, hmm. private organization. It could be any of those. Approved means you have the approval of the Department of Public Safety, and you deliver an approved curriculum. Currently, Motorcycle Safety Foundation curriculum is used in 48 states in the country. That's what we used here. So an approved school, school is a, a vague term there, but it's somebody that isn't just opening up off the sheet, street, signing up, putting a sign up and saying, come to my motorcycle school. That's not how we operate. Uh, and when it comes to quality, I understand it's difficult for Mr. Chairman, you and your members to get a grasp of that. There's much bigger fish to fry today out there in terms of what is a good school, what's a bad school. Mm -hmm. I'm a self-interested party. I, I can't say anything but. There's others that are self-interested. What I would rather do is submit a letter from the National Guard Mm -hmm. Excuse me, a respected training professional in the National Guard. Uh, if you would hand that to the hand that to the page, you'll bring it to the chair. Sir, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Uh, Major Jim Shirk has attended both Minsky and Ryder Academy. Mm -hmm. The letter you'll read writes eloquently and flowingly about the quality job performed at Ryder Academy. That does not say in any way, shape, or form it isn't a quality product at Minsky. I've been lucky to work with some of the people in this room in various aspects. I've been doing this since 2000. Again, we're lucky here in Minnesota that we have such a program. But that right there is an unbiased opinion. Let's see. And uh, if we go to mathematical numbers, I apologize. I have a degree in economics and math. Uh, Ms. Rasmussen commented that the National Guard benefits from training all over the state. I do not disagree. However, in 2008, 2009, we delivered the training to the National Guard. And we trained more than double the number of people that Minsky is. Soldiers might have had to drive, but they were driving to Camp Ripley. Soldiers already drive to Camp Ripley on a frequent and routine basis. I slept at Camp Ripley in 2008, 18 nights to deliver that training. So that answers the one question. 
uh, Mr. Chairman, we also heard some concerns about the price of training. The best way I think I can answer that is to look to our neighboring state, Wisconsin. I know we're not the same, but we do have a very similar demographic population, a very similar population size, and a very similar motorcycle population size. Wisconsin is a bit bigger, but under 10% bigger. So if you give me the latitude, we'll lump that together. We also have a very similar climate. Motorcycle training does not go on in Wisconsin in the winter. But in Wisconsin, the least expensive basic course you can get is $235. That's about 50% more than Minsk. Basic economics would then dictate as you move higher on the supply curve, demand would go down because it prices people out of the market. But again, I'll gladly mock the economists in the room because I'm one of them. And economic, er, economics, excuse me, doesn't always work. So in Wisconsin, despite the fact that public training costs considerably more, they're funding much less dollars from Wisconsin DOT. They're spending less on it. And then there's a whole bunch more schools that are open. It's easier to compete. What does that result in Wisconsin? They had over 10,000 riders trained in the basic rider course at less expense to Wisconsin DOT. Minnesota, we're seeing 7,000 for that number, 6,500, the numbers go up and down. So while the price is one fundamental aspect of a consumer making a choice, it isn't the only aspect. Again, large difference in price doesn't necessarily reflect quality, nor does it reflect supply or demand. If it did, you would go to states like Illinois and Ohio and see that the training only costs $25. Well, how can that be? Instructor pay is more per that per hour. Well, the reason why is the funding is coming from somewhere else. Other states, there's no funding, or all the schools are funded, and you see a price between $250 and $300. That's what it costs to deliver a basic rider course, which is the same curriculum used in 48 states here in Minnesota using the same instructors oftentimes. And so again, price is not the only thing out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Duncan, thank you for your comments. Questions for this testifier, members? Questions, comments? Anyone else in the audience want to testify for about this bill? Um, seeing no one else, and uh, the members uh, wrap up questions or comments for uh, Mr. Um, excuse, excuse me, Representative McDonald, uh, Representative Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I am going to uh, again ask about sending this to higher ed. It seems that there's a direct Minsky budgetary impact here. Uh, but I will ask Representative McDonald, Representative McDonald, back to line 1.15. I think you need to at least seriously consider moving the word approved in that sentence. And maybe I'm just being uh, very analytical, but it just says all schools. It doesn't say all approved schools. And uh, if I hear Mr. Duncan correctly about being open to the idea of being an approved school that would be a recipient, it would seem that you need to uh, look at that. But then if you make that decision, then there, there's some ramifications you got to think through. So uh, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to move an amendment, but I think you've got a problem there that needs to be fixed. Um, and Mr. Chair, I'll, just, I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your comments and suggestions, Representative Morrow. Representative Biskins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, as you're pondering that, Representative McDonald, moving on to the next committee, I um, also ask you to ponder seriously the words of our uh, colleague, Representative Gauthier, all right, who said that there are private organizations that are doing this and doing a good job and making money. Um, I have a fundamental principle, and I know you share it for the most part, is that government should not compete with the private sector when the private sector has proven perfectly capable of delivering a product or service. So ponder that also as this moves forward. Thank you for your comments. Further questions, comments? Uh, Representative uh, Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative McDonald, as you're pondering those things, please also ponder uh, my comments or our, our, our discussion on, uh, on line 1.13, which talks about schools and how you narrow that so that, you know, it, it, it would be consistent with what your thoughts are. But I do agree with Representative Biskins as well. Yes, I, uh, my 12-year-old was up riding the electric uh, bike at my house this weekend. I'm sure he'd love to be at junior high having this program, but I don't think that's your intention, <laughs> Representative McDonald. So, uh, committee, thank you for your suggestions to the author of this bill as it makes its journey. Representative Morrow, to your point, I know that my instructions are to move it to public <coughs> safety next. I certainly think the author should have a discussion with the uh, uh, chair of higher ed, see if he thinks it's important to go there. It certainly could be brought up on the floor as well. 
Uh, but I'm sure the author has heard uh, the concerns and will be taking those into account as the bill moves forward. Uh, anyone else in the audience? Seeing no one else, uh, Representative Shemansky renews his motion that uh, we didn't amend this bill, did we? So this bill uh, will be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Public Safety. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. You're on your way to public safety with work to do. Thank you, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, Representative Banyan, if you'd like to come down and have a small chat about private-public partnerships, that is something I think the committee would like to talk about. And, oh, uh, Representative McDonald, while you're still in the room, the uh, letter from uh, Mr. Duncan might be useful at public safety. I'd recommend you make copies for the committee. Uh, we have a copy here if you'd like. And, members, if you'd like a copy of the letter, uh, please call Mr. Nisley, and he will make it available to the committee members. We may do that anyhow. Good suggestion. Representative Banyan, welcome to the committee. Uh, we'll have somebody move your bill, and this bill is going to the general register should it pass our muster here. So that would be the motion somebody would like to make for House File uh, Mr. 2473. Mr. Chairman, I would move House File 2473 be recommended to pass and move to the general register. Thank you, uh, Representative Murray. Representative Banyan, welcome to the committee. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee, for hearing uh, House File 2473 today. Um, we all know that we live in a time that's uh, challenged in terms of uh, uh, resources generally. Funding for, for roads never seems and bridges never seems to be quite what we'd like it to be. I think that's true uh, throughout history, in fact. But um, uh, see, it seems more true these days. And so what I, what I am uh, uh, at... What I'm bringing to you today is an opportunity to think about uh, putting together uh, and authorizing Department of Transportation to engage in three pilot projects, up to three, um, up to three pi uh, uh, pilot projects for what I'll call th uh, P3 rather than, uh, than have to say a public-private partnership every time because I'm bound to get tongue-tied at some point during this testimony. Um, so. This, this authorizes the commissioner to select uh, mechanisms that are best for the state. It can, it can, include, uh, it can include a variety of mechanisms. Uh, let me point out that this, this bill isn't specifically uh, to, toll, to toll facilities, although toll facilities would be, would be possible under this. Uh, certainly don't want to misrepresent this. But this allows, um, this, this uh, in section one will allow uh, build, operate, transfer, uh, or build, transfer, and operate uh, types of uh, agreements, if those should be desired. Um, one particular issue that we have in central Minnesota is um, the connection between I-94 and US-10. Um, there has been long a uh, plan for, a, um, for an expressway to travel between the two highways as you make your way, uh, in, in, we usually think of it as making your way uh, toward uh, the uh, northwest out of the Twin Cities. Uh, for, for my constituents who live in the southeast side of St. Cloud, if you stay on I-94 past um, the exit uh, at Clearwater, you have to pretty much wind your way through St. Augusta, through the old St. Cloud Township, and, and around into southeast St. Cloud. It takes about uh, 15 minutes to do that. Uh, on contrast, uh, if you decide to go over um, Highway 24 uh, and then switch over to Highway 10 on that road, um, that's a two-lane road. It's not, it's not particularly on, on weekends, it's uh, pretty busy. Uh, so there has been in pl plans for some time uh, a desire for uh, some type of uh, expressway that travels between those two. This mechanism would be one way in which we could think about it, uh, specifically that project, which currently um, seems to be languishing uh, deep in the queues uh, of, um, of, of transportation, uh, something long wished for and never seems to get close to reality. Um, there, are, there are restrictions on this program. So, so for example, uh, we cannot have builders or, or, or uh, financers coming in to offer to roads directly. It will be up to uh, um, MnDOT to solicit projects. 
Uh, it must use a selective uh, competitive process. Um, it, cannot, uh, it cannot agree to any non-compete clauses. And at the end of the day, the facility is supposed to come back to the state. Uh, so there are factors involved in, 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 this, uh, in this bill. Uh, uh, there's a list of considerations that you can have in selecting uh, a public entity for one of these P3s. Um, and, and, um, it, this, and then Section 5 authorizes the use of federal funds or other funds that might be available to execute one of these P3s or bring additional money from other sources into the process, if you like. And then there is a reporting requirement in Section 6 that will tell you all, that will come back to this committee and to its relevant counterpart in the Senate to tell you what types of agreements have been entered into uh, with specific information, as you'll see in the bill. And with that, uh, oh, I should, before I conclude, you should have a letter co-signed by um, David Oxley, Executive Director of the American Council of Engineering uh, Committees, and uh, Doug Weiser, its uh, Legislative Committee Chair, in support of House File 2473. Members, I ask for your support and I stand for questions. Members, you uh, see the uh, ACEC letter and uh, have heard the comments of the bill author. Uh, questions, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so what we're basically talking about here from reading the brief on this, we're talking about toll roads. Is, if, um, is that what I'm, where I'm getting this? Or am I getting that right, Representative Banya? Representative Banya. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Nelson, um, there are a variety of ways in which one could, could envision a, a process by which one collects. They could, be toll, they could be tolls, including just the toll booths, but you could also use uh, mechanisms such as we currently have for uh, high occupancy lanes uh, for, for HOVs um, and, and for, for sort of dynamic uh, lanes that we, we have uh, currently existing in Minnesota. Thank you. Follow up, Representative Nelson. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, currently, it's my understanding, and maybe this has changed, but that the local cities that these go through have the ability to opt out of having a toll road because we have we have the ability in statute to do toll roads, but we have local if the local authorities can say no, I don't want a toll road in my community. Um, is would this override that part of statute that we currently have, where, or would? would men not be able to come in and put this in and, and say we're going to put a toll road, dynamic pricing, however you want to call it, it's a toll road by any other name. Um, would they be able to do this over the objection of the local unit of government? Uh, Representative um, Banyan, uh, I know that uh, in expounding on Representative Nelson's question, that uh, I think uh, the men pass lanes in particular, which is a tolling technique, requires specific legislative action to permit them to happen in addition to, I think, the local uh, municipality has to assent as well. Um, perhaps if it's off the interstate system, I'm not clear, but what we've got public safety, or I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Peterson, can you think about that? And I'll ask you that question in just a moment, okay, to clarify that. Representative Banning, if you want to uh, um, walk through that as well. Mr. Chairman uh, and, and Representative Nelson, uh, I'm unaware of, of, of the particular uh, piece of statute you're, you're speaking to. Maybe, maybe if, uh, if uh, House Research should have some thoughts on that, but um, I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you about that. Representative Nelson, it's a good question for the information of the committee. If you'd hold the thought, uh, we'll let Rep uh, Mr. Peterson uh, give me a signal when he has an answer, and we'll have him down and speak to that. Thank you, uh, Mr. The other, question follow I, up. Yeah. the other question I had was about the non-compete, and you said this is not going to have a non-compete clause. I know earlier we've seen some of this where they wanted to have in some places in the country where they've built some of these public private partnership toll facilities they've been unable to if MnDOT in our case wanted to build a road that goes in the same direction they were banned from doing that because the non-compete clauses that were in some of these agreements mm -hmm. um, but I again my question about that because I remember when they did 610 when they first started talking about that when I first got here there were some people I mean, the cities of uh, Maple Grove and Brooklyn Park and up that way had over the years bought up property knowing this road was going to go through there. And when we were just about at this point to getting it built, all of a sudden they wanted a public-private partnership and they wanted to put a toll road up there and they wanted to go uh, um, over the objections of both Maple Grove and Brooklyn Park. And the rest of the freeway system was, was built without those. They, a lot of these two cities put a lot of their own money into put it, buying us up this property so it was available, the right-of-way was available, and then they wanted to stick them with the toll road. So 
I'm, I want to know the answer to that question. It's because it's I, I do not like toll roads. And, you know, the, the dynamic pricing that we do on some of the sane lanes um, makes some sense. But to start put building toll roads in the state, we've had a long time been against doing that in, in the state of Minnesota. Now you can respond if you wish, Mr. Banyan, and we'll just take them as comments towards your bill. Um, and it doesn't look like Mr. Peterson is ready to talk to us yet. Representative Gauthier, I think you're next on the list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think Representative Nelson covered the territory, so I'm going to pass. No, thank you. Uh, Representative Morrow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Banyan, you mentioned toll roads as one of the options. You've got a couple in here in addition. I'm trying to understand the range of funding sources that your legislation would envision. So one is toll roads. What are the other funding mechanisms that your uh, bill would allow? Um, Representative Banyan. No, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, another, uh, there are other ways to think, to think about how, I mean, the, the point being, we, we have ways in which um, the builders of these, these uh, roads could, be, could receive payment back. They could, they could operate a toll themselves. They could operate perhaps uh, uh, the, the dynamic pricing and HO. So you could imagine, for example, rather than thinking about the uh, the 9410 interchange. Think about another lane on I-94 being built alongside by a private by a private entity. Uh, that private entity would then be able to say use the MinPath system, uh, and in so doing, then send the money back to the builder rather than having the builder operate the um, the uh, pricing system along that along that dynamic lane. Maybe that lane's wide open at 10 in the morning but priced to be expensive relatively expensive at five in the afternoon i mean so there are a variety of ways in which in in which that that process can be done follow up Representative Morrill. well thank you mr chair and i just want to make sure that i'm understanding this because I, I have a potential amendment in mind here uh so i hear toll roads something dynamic pricing along the you know maybe something along the min pass route of having one lane in which you pay maybe all the time maybe uh part of the day the dynamic process is there any other funding me it says mechanisms the commissioner may consider include but are not limited to toll facilities BOT or BTO and I'm just wondering if there's anything else before I offer my amendment that you have in mind uh, Representative Banyan Mr. Chairman Representative Morrow I don't have any in my head right this second so perhaps we should hear what your amendment is no. uh, well, I think we will Mr. Chair if I might Representative Morrow uh, I think uh, if Mr. Pearson is correct uh, uh, ready because I think we need to answer the tolling question Let's. and 160.85 if I get some started Mr. Peterson uh, thank you for being a resource to us can you come down and stand for a question or two of the clarifying sort Mr. Peterson Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, Scott Peterson from the MnDOT Government Affairs Office. And um, I think it was Representative Nelson raises a question about uh, what we have referred to as kind of the municipal veto with respect to toll provisions, and that that provision would remain in effect um, with this bill. So there is municipal veto then, to be clear. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Moore, you had a question for him as well? Or for well, I, well, I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm reading uh, subsec subdivisions 2 and 3 of 160.85. And Mr. Peterson, I'm just trying to understand, can you build a toll road anywhere in Minnesota, or does it have to be in the metropolitan area? Mr. Peterson. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Morrow, I guess um, I, uh, I would imagine if this bill were passed, you could build a toll road anywhere in Minnesota with the appropriate approvals. Right now, there is a you know, a blanket prohibition against toll roads that's in statute, which is uh, repealed or doesn't, you know, not applicable in to the provisions of this bill. It's an interesting question, Representative Morrow asked, Mr. Peterson, because the two, uh, soon to be three, I believe, are all on uh, that we have authorized or will are on interstate highways. Would it be possible to build one on, say? Highway 62, which is a state highway, or US 52, which is a US federal highway. Uh, are we precluded from doing that if we had municipal assent and legislative approval? Uh, Mr. Chairman, no, we're not necessarily prohibited from doing it uh, by law, but uh, I think financially, you know, the attractiveness uh, of a 
proposal like this or a, an agreement like this would be that there'd be sufficient traffic well, to generate some kind of revenue or there'd be sufficient roadside development for other types of financing to be available. Thank you for clarifying. Right, follow up, Representative Morrill. Well, Mr. Chair, maybe I'll ask you a question first. Do we have other testifiers on your list? We do, yes. Okay, I'll wait till we hear the other testifiers. Perhaps, and then I've got uh, Representative Benson want to speak to this uh, question before we get to uh, uh, Mr. Hausladen. Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to Mr. Peterson or, or uh, Representative Banyan. Uh, you know, I know that um, it, the projects like this take some time if they're going to be state-owned and state-developed and, and built and so on. So there's a good possibility this is already on a 20-year uh, a plan or 30-year plan or something of that nature. Uh, I'm curious of whether or not there, and, and I certainly wouldn't uh, advocate for this being an amendment to your bill, but if I look at the future value of things and if we could do this as a private for toll, uh, for pay, uh, toll uh, bridge road uh, at this point, but then uh, as we pass bonding bills or it comes up, uh, with the possibility of including something that would allow for the state in essence to take over that same road without having to reconstruct anything new or uh, with the idea that of course the person who took the risk to build the road uh, is going to need to be remunerated for that. Uh, is, is that, is that a, in the realm of possibilities? Representative Banyan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think it is, it is uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and Re Representative uh, Benson. I mean, remember that the, the purpose of using these P3s is, is in part to move the risk of building a road that turns out, or a bridge that turns out not to have great value, moving it off of the taxpayers and onto investors and let them, let them take the risk instead. If it turns out that the investment was a good one, mm -hmm. um, then I could imagine the state coming forward at that point saying, well, the road has proven its value. We'd like to offer you, uh, offer you uh, the balance of what you're due on this at this time, perhaps with, with something. You could do that in the terms of a, of a, uh, of a bonding bill. And, and I mean, again the, 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 again, the purpose of this is to just think about uh, doing things in a more businesslike approach. Uh, when you travel on private private roads, they tend to be they tend to be uh, oriented toward the consumer uh, a, a little bit more. We've seen that happen with the uh, 91 uh, freeway out in um, out in the Los Angeles area, for example, uh, which which uh, actually developed dynamic pricing to the extent they call it perfect pricing. Uh, I'm, and and uh, that would be another. That would be an example of where they've really tried to manage the road in a way that is uh, best for the uh, citizens of the uh, of that uh, Los Angeles basin. Follow up. You might. Uh, Mr. Peterson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Benson, um, I agree largely with what uh, Representative Banyan said that these agreements can take many forms, which have many. Um, you know, sets of terms that could be used for reconveyance or conveyance of the facility to the public ownership. And I think his bill actually foresees a circumstance where it says that basically all types of agreements that would be enacted under these provisions would eventually have to transfer back to public ownership at some point. And just, and this uh, follow up a little bit to the, to the 20 year statement. Um, the project that's called out in the bill here, actually the environmental impact statement is complete on that. And so the timeline, uh, on which that could be completed would be relatively quickly compared to some other projects that might come forward because that work has been done. Thank you. I have two other testifiers who would like to speak to the bill, but I do have Representative Champion who would ask you to recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a brief question to Representative Banyan. Um, I see on uh, lines 1.7 and 1.8, 1. 1. 1.17 and 1.18, that you identify a specific uh, uh, highway and, in, and, and interstate. So I want to know, number one, how did you come up with that, with uh, this particular project? And two, whether you have any information that would lead you to believe that there's an interest by the local government or the local municipality to, uh, uh, to want to go forward with this sort of mechanism. Representative Banyan. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Champion. Great question. Um, that that area is uh, an area that still falls under the school district that covers St. Cloud as well. I can tell you that the that the school district has uh, not within the last 10 years purchased land for the possible expansion of its school system to have another another elementary school in the area. Um, there were at times uh, annexation 
annexation guidelines for for Haven Township um, that are still in the process of being uh, moderated. So uh, being uh, modified and and looked at now since the housing uh, boom that was going on earlier in the last decade has uh, obviously hit the hit the rocks. But uh, but that's an area that has long been thought to be an area where expansion would likely occur. And I would go back to my previous comments, Representative Champion, that southeast side of St. Cloud currently, if you want to get the, if you want to get to that part of town east of the river, I-94 doesn't serve you terribly well, and Highway 10 has a lot of stoplights on it, and uh, so a lot of people try to do this to take uh, two-lane roads to sort of snake back in there and as a matter of safety as well as uh, convenience, um, I think they would be better served by, by a, a limited access highway. Thank you. Uh, members, just a little housekeeping. We have a couple of handouts. One is which myths and facts about transportation. Can somebody admit to who handed this out? Oh, Mr. Houseland. Okay, he's going to testify in a moment. Good deal. Um, we did look at the, it was relevant and uh, pretty straightforward, but uh, usually I like to have a, just a heads up. So thank you. It was one of our testifiers. Uh, Mr. Peterson, did you want to comment to that before I call Mr. Houseland down? Um, to Mr. Mr. Champion's question. No, Mr. Chairman. All right, thanks. Uh, I will just point out to members that uh, the governor has assembled a task force to look at alternative transportation financing. The members from the House are Representative Morrow and myself, and we're looking forward to uh, some good work over the uh, interim on that committee. Uh, and I have a hunch we'll be talking about this uh, um, method of financing as well uh, going forward. Just, oh, by the way, for housekeeping. Representative Houseman. Uh, I thought, Mr. Chair, that, um, that he looked as though he wanted to add one other thing, but it wasn't in direct response to your question. I didn't know if there was additional testimony that the department wanted to offer for the record. Uh, Mr. Peterson, do you have something else to shed a little light on this discussion as we're moving forward? It, Mr. Chairman, uh, the only thing I was going to add was in reference to the work by the task force that you already brought up and that there were some key uh, items that were brought up in the, in the course of that task force's work that I think are good ideas in terms of um, building public confidence in in these types of agreements and their acceptance among the general public that they actually are in the public interest whenever something like yes. this is concluded and basically it revolves around having in a kind of a third party um, oversight group that would uh, ensure that you know provide some objective assurance that the again the terms of the agreement are truly in the public interest and that uh, they would oversee a financial analysis that would also uh, further confirm that the uh, the use of their revenues and the distribution of the revenues between the private and public parties are again uh, apportioned appropriately and the public interest is well protected in the agreement. Thank you for your comment. Representative Gothi, uh, you are on the list. Do you need to comment now or do you want to wait for Mr. Uh, it's Lodge? for Mr. Peterson. Mr. It Chair. is. Mr. Peterson, if you'd hold on just a second. <laughs> uh, Representative Gothi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Peterson. Uh, could you just tell us how we pay for highways now, construction of highways? Mr. Peters. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gauthier, um, the state, state highways are funded from three uh, primary state revenue sources, uh, gas taxes, uh, tab fees, and the motor vehicle sales tax. And then uh, also a significant portion comes from the Federal Highway Trust Fund, which is paid for by gas taxes. Mr. Chairman. Representative Gauthier. Uh, Mr. Peterson, just being a northern boy, um, when, when we have these lanes for uh, during heightened traffic and, and you use your Metro Pass or drop a toll or whatever, do you think people think they're paying for convenience and speed or do you think they're paying for the highway? What do you think the public thinks? Because I know how it was sold. Peterson, you're welcome to take a stab at that if you'd like. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gauthier, um, I'm not very good at reading minds, um, but in our survey work, uh, it it appears to us that the people who use our MinPass lanes are paying for the reliability and the opportunity to avoid being stuck in traffic. So the reliability of their trip times is, is one of the primary things. That Representative Gauthier. This follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Peterson, because I think that's what they think. Uh, and so basically, Representative Banyan, your, your bill really is opening up 
a whole new can of worms, you know. Um, and I'm just thinking of Joe Public, who's who's going down the interstate, and all of a sudden they're, they're going to take get on a toll road, um, and they're probably going to be. And this is more of a comment, and you can respond if you want. Uh, they're going to be thinking, why am I paying for this again? I've already paid with it for my gas tax, my motor vehicle tax, and I didn't ask for a convenient highway uh, like a Metro Pass, but now all of a sudden I got a toll road I got to pay for. I mean, how do you get past that public perception? Members, the chair is having a flashback. I'm sure Representative Nelson is here with me too. <laughs> Ten years ago, whenever the uh, the uh, Min Pass project was in front of us, and we had these same questions, same comments. Good questions, and good comments, all that every legislature needs to visit. Representative Benny, you can comment if you wish. Otherwise, I would like to ask Mr. Houslauden up here, who's probably going to answer the very questions the Representative Gottfried just asked. So, I'll defer. Peterson, thank you for your, uh, your information. I'll, be, I'll make it back to you. I'll Mr. Houslauden, welcome to the committee, and uh, you know the drill. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is John Houslauden. I'm president of the Minnesota Trucking Association. And uh, I want to apologize that we didn't indicate uh, that we were the author of the one handout there on the myths and facts. We want to talk a bit about that. I do want to thank you for the opportunity to what today is hopefully just the beginning of a dialogue regarding the role of public-private partnerships, also called P3s, because I agree that's quite a, a mouthful to say repeatedly. And as we express to Representative Banning in private discussions, we do support his desire to improve Minnesota's road and bridge infrastructure and in the most efficient and cost-effective manner possible. So to that end, we look forward to continuing our discussions on how to address the state's transportation needs. However, we have very serious concerns about the approach taken in House File 2473, and we strongly oppose the bill. Uh, we believe that House File 2473 is fundamentally a tolling program. If you think about it, the only way that private firms can recoup their initial investment plus a profit margin, is the toll. And as you've already noted, this runs counter to the current policy of the state, as well as the public's opinion towards tolling. And back in 2008, when we last increased our fuel tax, uh, that's part of the debate we had about we would increase the fuel tax, but make sure that tolling was something we didn't do, so the legislature in its wisdom put le language in that, that uh, prohibited tolling on existing general purpose lanes. And while P3s have a lot of conceptual appeal, especially for states that are looking for more transportation funding, in practice, P3s rarely work out well. And the, the handout that we gave you goes into some of those details. Based on the limited P3 instances we have in the U.S., we can say a few things. First, they don't really bring in new money to the state, but they're effectively a loan against future revenue. Second, to ensure private sector interests and this is very important, Private, privatized roads require exclusive access and significant traffic volumes. Uh, third, there is rarely any public input regarding rate setting, which is a critical to the users, and most P3 leases have been negotiated behind closed doors. Again, this is what we're seeing across the country. Four, they are costly to administer. The data shows us that public toll facilities eat up 25 to 30 percent of toll revenue for administration alone. Now, private toll roads will add a profit margin on top of this. Now, compare that to the state fuel tax administration, which costs us about 2 to 3 percent. And current P3 projects nationally are performing poorly and will likely suffer from lower maintenance. So just one example. We need look no farther than the Macquarie Private Investment Group. Perhaps you've heard their name. Uh, Macquarie has the three US P3 facilities, high profile ones, including the Chicago Skyway, and the Indiana Toll Road. They were found to be so far underwater with estimated debt and liabilities exceeding assets by billions of dollars that in the fall of 2010, McCreary shareholders forced the firm to spin off its P3 toll group as nearly a bankrupt, junk bond quality boutique. It wasn't working well. And apparently the U.S. Senate agrees with this assessment. In its version of the Federal Highway Bill passed just last week, there is a provision that was added that would deduct any P3 road miles from the federal reimbursement calculation. And lastly, this legislation vastly expands the scope and authority of the Minnesota Department of Transportation with what we believe is inadequate oversight. 
which could put Minnesota on a fast track to statewide implementation of tolling. So for all of these reasons, we urge the committee to lay the bill over for interim review and discussions. This is a big issue. We're just starting it. Uh, we respectfully make that suggestion to the, to the committee. And I thank you for your time and stand ready for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Houselotten, for your testimony. Members, are there questions for Mr. Houselotten at all? Uh, thank you. If you'd stay close by just in case. And uh, Mr. Neumeister, you'd indicated you wanted to say a few kind words about the bill as well. Or a few words about the bill. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chairman, for the record, my name is Rich Neumeister. Um, with the bill being heard today, our inertia is pushing for this bill. It already has made that line on the Senate side, I take it. But when I saw this and I read the bill, some of the points that were already been made by the previous speaker uh, and Mr. Peterson is the word public, public confidence, public process, public ability to scrutinize and find if the actions of their government are accountable. I just point out some things in the bill that I think if this bill is going to go forward needs some more discussion. What is the public, what is the 3P procurement method? I don't know what that is. And also, Mr. Chairman, on that, that's on, uh, I don't see that defined. On page one on 10, notwithstanding Minnesota statutes or any other law to the contrary. I'm very always familiar with that notwithstanding. Those are one of those little trick words in process that all of a sudden, oops, did we do that last year? And I think that's important to find out to where that is. But one of, one of the other things on page, on, on line 23 is, and it gets back to the public scrutiny and accountability. If we take a look, I, well, I'll say historically, MnDOT has been very proud of its public accountability, public uh, scrutiny. So, and I just, uh, with MnDOT representatives last week on an issue of subcontracting, if the public wants to look at their subcontracts, it was very clear that it seems from their policy, the public can look at those subcontracts. But one on line 23, Commissioner shall select a private entity, two words on 23, competitive basis. So what in, in the law are they, what of the methods of competitive basis are they using it so that the public can eventually look at all the data, all the proposals, and what does it mean by the maximum extent possible? So Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I just uh, share a, a few points of view on that. Uh, particularly also when I asked Mr. Banyan how this new scheme, in a neutral sense scheme, not in a negative sense, but if the new scheme implemented, how would the Data Practices Act comply with? Because under current law, there are some ways under MnDOT where information is public, and I don't know how this new P, 3P will fit into that, to the Data Practices Scheme. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the few moments of your time. Appreciate your comments. Questions for Mr. Neumeister? Members, um, we've had a good discussion on this bill. It just uh, seems to the committee that this is a very big subject that's going to be touched on at length in the interim by the task force the governor has asked some of us to serve on. So, Mr. Murray, um, with your assent, I'd like to uh, uh, just lay this bill over and not recommend that it go to the general register. Unless there's other compelling discussion, members, uh, the chair is going to lay over House File 2473. And if we need to take it up again at a further date, uh, we'll not post it, notify you, and take it up again. But uh, with that, the bill is laid over. Members, next on the agenda, uh, agenda item number six, consideration of the committee bonding recommendations in your packet and posted last um, week, I think Friday morning, Mr. Nisley posted. The committee bonding recommendations that we referred to the Capital Investment Committee. Members, we did not put dollar amounts in them, um, and we did not uh, necessarily rank them, but these are the ones that received the uh, uh, well over a majority of the committee votes, and these are the ones we'll forward on. This is not an assurance that they will be included in any bonding bill that uh, Chairman Howes may put together, but uh, at least he has an indication of our interest in which ones uh, uh, we would like to see go forward from here. And with that, the Chair will stand for questions. Representative Morrow. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, we've done this a little differently in, in different committees, so I just want to be clear. So mm -hmm. what we'd be voting on is this list that's before us of the, I think it's eight items. And this committee would send those eight items to Chair, 
Chair Howe's committee? Correct. Yes. Again, without ranking or without dollar amounts, these are the ones we would like him to uh, put a place in uh, his bonding bill as he's assembling it. A follow-up, Representative Morrill? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. So as, has Representative House put together his bill then? Or you say he's putting it together? He is putting it together, yes. Thank you. Um, his, um, he's putting it together. Let me leave it at that. So, yes. Uh, Representative Houseman. I don't know if there were other questions. I, I I was a little confused about the timing because um, I happen to be on that committee as mm -hmm. well. And my understanding is that in about a half an hour, um, if it hasn't already, that that spreadsheet will be available to the press because we already have it. Good. So, um, so um, right now I actually <laughs> um, have the Representative House spreadsheet. And so I'm wondering whether whether the committee has had any opportunity for uh, representative houseman and the committee as a whole probably not uh, actually um representative house told me he wanted these by wednesday or thursday last week or he was going to give me a big fat zero i said i don't think so i think it'll be there friday i think the discussion in the leadership corner was no friday would be sufficient these were posted at noon on friday mr nisley is that correct noon or, short, yeah. at noon or one o'clock on friday and it, where they were transmitted to the um Committee Administrator of the Bonding Committee. So he knows our indications. Uh, it's not the Chair's intention to, to alter or modify these uh, today. Um, basically asking the committee just to ratify the list that's already been sent to Representative House. I have not been party to the list that you might have there, but uh, my full and expectation is that Mr. House, Chair, uh, Representative House, Chairman House, would uh, have heard our recommendations from Friday and had some accommodation for particularly the GO portion of our bonding suggestions. So further questions or comments? Members, I'm looking forward to seeing what Mr. Howes has to say to our deal, but we'll wait for his uh, his official paperwork to come down the pike here shortly. Representative Morrill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I hear and I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm also looking now at this list mm -hmm. that Chairman House has already put out. And on his list, members, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 different things. Not 8, but 14. Hmm. And of those... But only 6 funded. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. He didn't... Let me get, go back to the funded ones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's, uh, it's, it's, you go ahead. Okay. Representative Hausman knows it better than I do. Um, yes. Well, Mr. Representative Chair. Morrow and Representative Hausman, the list is not public. The chair doesn't have it. My committee administrator doesn't have it. We're just trying to find Paul, uh, the timeline that was set by the leadership corner. We forwarded our stuff by noon or 1 o'clock on Friday, and uh, we're just uh, here to ratify our list now and make it kind of a public deal. And um, I, that's all I can tell you today. I can't speak to what he's done or what that list might say until I actually have the official copy in my hand. So. Um, Representative Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm not going to... Excuse I, me. Representative Morrow. I know. I, I'm <laughs> not, I don't feel... That, Mr. Chair, I feel like you think I'm busting your chops. I'm really not trying to. It's a little distressing that we're voting on a list, yes. and there's a different list in the chairman's bill. Uh, there's some overlap, and I respect that you may have been put in a position that you didn't want to be in, but I'm just saying, members, we're about to vote on a list, but there's already a list in the chairman's bill. So I'm just wondering, are you going to advocate then after today for this list, or is this the list? Representative Morrow, if this committee uh, endorses the list that was put together by this committee process, I will advocate for this list. So um, thank you for making me aware that the chairman of the Bonnie Committee apparently has something he's put together, but I will be going to see him about this list if this is the one the committee wishes to put together, because I'm the chairman of this committee and you are members of this committee, and that's my job is to advocate for this committee's work. The chair moves that we uh, in recommend uh, the list that's in front of you, these eight, the chairman of the bonding committee notwithstanding um, and that we recommend these and uh, I'll take it down there and advocate for them uh, forcefully further discussion to this list thank you for making me aware of that I appreciate it seeing none let's vote all in favor signify by aye aye, aye. opposed no the motion prevails the uh, chair will go see the chair and we'll have a chat about the eight recommendations of this committee thank you for your attention to these matters <laughs> members is there anything else to come before us today yeah uh, seeing none, um, our next committee meeting will be Wednesday, 
Uh, usual time, usual place. With that, members, we are adjourned. <laughs>